Welcome, ladies, to Women's Bible Study. I'm so blessed and happy to be here with you all today. Um, I just wanted to bring up something that happened in the, in the past couple of weeks. Uh, I'm a barista at Starbucks, and every so often I see one or two of you guys come through the store, and, and we'll have an exchange of just how you've seen me on, on these past uh, couple of recordings, and it's just like... It's just so amazing to have that community with you guys. And I just love being able to see you guys and know you guys and just be able to talk to you. And, and I just want to say how grateful I am for that. Um, and today we're going to be singing a new song. It's called Promise Keeper. And as we sing, I just want us to reflect on the promises that God makes to us, his followers, throughout so many, so many chapters of the Bible. And just how faithful he is in all of that. Your vows are covenant unbroken. You've made it known through history. Your love will never be unfair. Never walk out on me, never walk out on me. I have no reason to doubt you. Who you have been, you'll always be. And though the future's still unfolding, everything I've seen. Your word will never fail My heart can trust you, Jesus I won't be overwhelmed My eyes are gonna see Miracles and victories You are a promise keeper Your word will never fail You will return that's been stolen There's nothing that you can't redeem And though the story's still unfolding With everything I've seen How could I not believe You are You are a promise keeper Your word will never fail Trust you, Jesus, I won't be overwhelmed. My eyes are gonna see miracles and victories. You are a promise keeper, your word will never fail. And I'll see your goodness in the land of the living. I see your goodness right here, right now. You know the ending before the beginning. I know that you have worked all things out. I know I see your goodness in the land of the living. I see your goodness right here, right now. the beginning I know that you have worked all things out I know I know you are a promise keeper your word will never fail my heart can trust you Jesus I won't be overwhelmed my eyes are gonna see miracles and Your word will never fail. My heart can trust. 
trust you, Jesus, I won't be overwhelmed. My eyes are gonna see miracles and victories. You are a promise keeper. Your word will never fail. Never fail.
Hi, ladies. Welcome. We are at the last week of our of our session in Acts, and it's crazy that we're already here. Uh, it's a little bit bittersweet to be here because I've so enjoyed diving into Luke's writing with you and learning about the adventures of Paul. And so um, it's a weird feeling today when I woke up and I was praying for this last lesson. I thought, man, it's been so great to be with you and to witness the power of the Holy Spirit to carry the gospel uh, to the ends of the earth. And now we are in our final week. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you're with me. I'm excited. Um, but this doesn't mean that we're done reading the Word of God. We have something exciting that we've announced the last two weeks that I just want to remind you of. We are doing something new this summer called Summer in the Psalms. And essentially, it is a daily reading plan for us to be in God's Word together. And so it's going to start on June 15th and run all the way from August 15th. For 62 days, we are going to conquer 150 Psalms. Uh, And we want to do that together as a community. We believe that the Lord is inviting us uh, to be in His Word, to continue to grow in discipleship. Uh, Just because Bible study is over doesn't mean we stop reading God's Word. And so I want to invite you to register uh, for that. Registration opens today. um, And you're invited by signing up. You are signing up to be part of our reading plan which will also include an optional weekly devotional written by women in our community. So that's something you can opt in and out of. Um, And also, out of all that, we are going to have optional six-week Psalms groups. Uh, If you want to journey through the Psalms with other women, that's a great opportunity to do that. But we also know uh, it's been a long year. We know a lot of people uh, use summer as a time to rest. And so there's no obligation to that. That's not what summer in the Psalms is. It's just an additional component that you can sign up either to lead or be part of if that's something you're interested in. But my hope is that no matter what you're doing this summer, no matter where you are, that you would join in reading through the Psalms with us and see what God wants to speak to you this summer. Um, So I'm excited about that. Register for that today and we can do that all together this summer. So um, this week, this last week, we are talking about what it means to be people who trust. And so before we dive into the lesson, I just want to pray for us and I want to invite the Lord to do a new work in us uh, and to remind us of what it looks like for us to trust in Him today. So will you pray with me? Uh, Father, I invite you into this space right now, Father, that you would come and that you would have your way in each of us, Father. Uh, We desire to be women who trust you, God, who trust you more than we trust ourselves. And so, Lord, would you speak to us today in the power of your word, where we see you at work in our lives, working behind the scenes for our good. Uh, We thank you for who you are. We thank you for women's Bible study. We thank you for our groups, and we thank you uh, for your beautiful word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, we are diving in the last two chapters. We've seen Paul all over Asia uh, bringing the word of God to communities that have never heard it. And so these last two chapters, we're going to go on an epic sea adventure uh, with Paul, and we're going to see what the Lord has in store for him there. So we, as always, these are such long chapters, so uh, we're going to get through two chapters, but we're not going to read it all. So we're going to kind of chunk it out. Um, And so you can start with me. We're going to start in verse nine today. So it said, much time had been lost uh, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was the day of atonement. So pause there. Paul, uh, remember, is getting sent to Rome. And so he's taken on the ship as a prisoner along with a bunch of other prisoners. And they're heading, they're making this long journey uh, over to Rome, which is about 125 miles away. Uh, But what we saw in the first line is that they're leaving on the Day of Atonement, which is in late um, November, October, uh, in the fall. And during this time is when the sea starts to get very dangerous, very aggressive, uh, strong winds. It's unlikely uh, that they're going to have a safe passage. So Paul uh, notes that because Paul, if you'll remember, Paul's journeyed over 3,500 miles on sea at this point. And uh, in Corinthians, he talks about that he's lived through three shipwrecks. So Paul, although not a sailor by nature, has some experience uh, in this department. So he's headed as a prisoner on a boat to Rome. That's where we pick off. Uh, Verse 10. And so Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. Uh, But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that they should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both southwest and northwest. So basically there's a hired hand of shipmen uh, who are going to deliver these prisoners 
listeners over and they all take a vote that they'd like to go to Phoenix because why? Phoenix has better restaurants, new theaters, better weather. They'd like to make it there. So they're going to take the risk of venturing out into unsaleable waters so that they can winter in a nicer place than where they are. So that's where, that's where they're at. Verse 13, when a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force, called the Northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cotta, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given to you the lives of all those who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. All right, so they're in, they're heading out to deliver the prisoners to Rome, and what comes along but a storm? Friends, this is the story of our lives. As we seek different opportunities, as we're moving about our day, there are always storms uh, that come out of the blue. Usually it started with a gentle breeze and it turned into a storm. Uh, and so the first lesson, if you're taking notes today, the first point that we see uh, is that Paul didn't let his circumstances determine his consequence or his confidence. Paul didn't let him, his circumstances determine his confidence. So here we see Paul is entering a storm. And you can see from the beginning of the story, Paul knew this was bad news. This was a bad decision. He warned everybody. Uh, they didn't listen to him. And so they head out. And sure enough, a nor'eastern comes and they go days uh, in this storm where they have to throw away their tackle. They start throwing off ships. They have to get rid of all their security uh, just in hopes of staying alive. Uh, these are what we call the storms of life. And I wonder if any of you are in a storm. I wonder if there's anything in your life that you didn't foresee, that you didn't expect, uh, that things have gotten hard when you thought that you were on your way to somewhere important. Uh, and it's no different with Paul. Paul knows that he is destined for Rome. And so what he does is he doesn't focus on the storm. He doesn't focus on the fact that they're losing cargo, they're losing tackle, they're not going to be able to fish. Paul focuses on the word of God. Remember the Lord spoke to him that he would testify about him in Rome. And so Paul, Paul relies not on his expectations, external feelings, not in the craziness of the situation, Paul goes back to his confidence in the Lord that what the Lord is spoken is true. And so I wonder today for those of you that are in a storm, is there a word that the Lord's given you that you can cling to, that you can hold on to? Because here's the reality. You and I know this. When we're in a storm, it feels like it will last forever. But all of us have been through storms and we all know they don't last forever. Storms pass. This is just a season. So when you're facing your storm today, I don't know what it is. It might be your marriage. It might be your relationship with your kids. It might be your job. It might be a relationship with a friend. It might be your financial situation. It might be a medical condition. I don't know what your storm is, but I want to encourage you to keep your confidence in the Lord and not on anything that's happened externally because God uses storms for our good. The storm is like the chaos in the middle, but on the other side, there is something for you. And Paul knows that. Paul has a job to do on the other side of this storm. And so he doesn't focus on the terror and the fear and the waves crashing around him. Paul sticks to the word of God and holds true to that. And I wonder what the Lord's inviting you to hold true to. Where is your confidence today? As you watch the storm swirl around you, where can you put your eyes? I believe that there's four ways that God uses storms in the Bible uh, for our good. 
And the first one, uh, four types of storms. The first one is a storm of correction. Uh, if you've ever read the Bible, the story of Jonah, God sends Jonah to Nineveh. And what does Jonah do? Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. That's where all his enemies are. So God assigns him. And what does he do? He takes off the other direction. So what does the Lord do? Jonah leaves. He's trying to escape his assignment because he does not want to go tell his enemies about the Lord. God brings a storm, sends a little whale, scoops Jonah up and delivers him to Nineveh. God will use storms in our life to correct us when we're disobedient. Because when we're disobedient, that means we're walking away from the will of God, for, away from his purposes, away from his plans. And so if there's a storm in your life right now, I wonder if it's God's way of correcting or changing your course of direction, putting you back in alignment with what he's called you to be obedient with. The second storm we see is storms of perfection. Uh, if you'll remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 and the disciples were there, they all got in the boat right afterwards and set sail for the other side of the sea. And what happened that night is that Jesus fell asleep and a storm came and it terrified the disciples. Now, remember, these are the disciples that just watched Jesus feed 5,000 people, but they were afraid of the storm. And so Jesus took it as an opportunity to bring their faith deeper, to perfect their trust in him. And so Jesus stood up, he calmed the storm and said, do not be afraid, I'm with you. I am greater than the storm. So maybe there's something right now in your life that the Lord wants to remind you that he's bigger than the storm. Maybe he's sanctifying you. Maybe he's growing you in your ability to trust him. That's the second way that God uses storms to perfect us. The third way he uses storms is to protect us. If you'll remember the beginning of the Bible uh, where Noah and his family were the only believers, it said that everyone else was doing evil inside of the Lord. And so the Lord commanded Noah to build, build an ark and he did. And then God sent a storm. He sent a storm to remove the evil, to bring to bring his people uh, back into a covenant of trust with him, to reestablish the earth in faith in the Lord. And so God protected Noah by sending the storm. And so I wonder if any of you today, uh, there's a season of your life that you're in a storm and you don't understand it. I wonder if by chance it could be a protection from something that you maybe can see or maybe can't see, but maybe the Lord is protecting you. Uh, And the last way that God uses storms is what we see in this passage. God uses the storm to redirect Uh, Paul and his ministry. Because you see, Paul knows he has to go to Rome, but the Lord has a a side assignment for him. God redirects him to the island of Malta, which we're going to get to later in the text, uh, to do ministry there, to minister to his people. So God redirects his path before he heads to Rome. I don't know what your storm is or how God's using it, but I would encourage you today, where do you need to see God at work? Where do you need to hold and trust that he is bigger than the storm. Because friends, storms come and go, but the Lord and the word of the Lord lasts forever. God is with you in this. I believe the invitation the Lord gives us is to trust him in spite of our circumstances. In spite of what you're going through, God is bigger and he's able to see you through the storm. And so we see Paul fix his eyes on Jesus, not on the surroundings. That's the first thing we learn from Paul. All right, we're jumping ahead. So anyway, so they're in this storm and they're about to get shipwrecked. And so we're going to jump in starting in verse 33. It says, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. So the second thing we learn from Paul today is that Paul didn't let his position change his purpose. Again, Paul didn't let his position change his purpose. So if you'll remember, Paul is a prisoner on this ship of prisoners. Paul is the lowest of the totem pole. Paul is with men uh, who are sent from other provinces as prisoners to Rome uh, to be put into the bullpen that allows animals to eat humans for entertainment. So all these prisoners that he's talking to, they know they're headed to their death sentence. And Paul Paul is not headed to the same situation. He's headed for trial, but they're all prisoners 
sailors on board a ship. But Paul doesn't let that deter him from the purpose that God has for his life. Paul stands up and he pastors them. He encourages them. He reminds them of the hope that they're called to. Now, mind you, they are about to wreck their ship. They're about to lose all the cargo. They're about to have to swim for their lives. And Paul gets up and encourages them. And I wonder how often you and I uh, put too much emphasis on our position. Had Paul been concerned about the fact that he was a prisoner, he might not have acted in the fullness of the purposes God designed him for. Because I think in our culture, you and I, we can get caught up in titles, uh, position, who has authority, what's her status. And sometimes if we don't feel very good about our position, we kind of use it as an excuse to justify, well, I can't do that. You know, Coley, like I'm not, I'm not a missionary. Coley, I'm not a pastor. Coley, I'm not the CEO. I don't get to make those decisions about integrity. Coley, I'm not the one running, running my friend group. I can't tell them to stop gossiping. We, we tend to belittle our position instead of focusing on the purpose that God has for us in each situation. Um, it's surprising when you read through the Bible that God loves to use people in lowly positions uh, to bring about significant changes. Uh, we think of Moses. Moses was a murderer who ran away kind of to the desert, was camping out in his father-in-law's house when God went and found him and spoke to him and called him back to lead Israel out of captivity. And you think of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ Christ, who was born in a manger to immigrant parents on the wrong side of the tracks, God used Jesus to change the entire course of human history, to redeem the world. And now we see Paul, Paul who was a persecutor, who is now a prisoner, kind of on the lowest rung uh, of society. Paul is encouraging these 276 men to believe in God, to have a hope bigger than themselves. And so I wonder today, if I were to ask you about your position, uh, where has the Lord positioned you? God wants to use you exactly where you are, whether you like it or not, whether you think it's acceptable, it doesn't matter. God wants to use you and he can use you exactly as you are. So I don't know if you are a barista these days. I don't know if you're a stay-at-home mom. I don't know if you're the CEO of a law firm downtown. I don't, I don't know your, your position uh, relationally. I don't know your position at work. I don't know your position in your friend groups, at the PTA. I don't know that. But what I do know is that God does not want you and I to make excuses for why we can't fulfill the purposes he has for us. I believe he's appointed you to be exactly where you are for this time in this season. And here's the thing about positions. They, they aren't forever. Just because you're in a position today doesn't mean you'll be there in three weeks, but it does mean that you are in this position today and God wants to use you today. So I wonder when you think about your life, uh, what are some of the positions you hold? And what are some of the excuses? I'm, I'm saying this to you because I know this, I do this myself. But God, if I only had this, then I could do this. But God, if I, if I were only better at that, then I could do that. God, if I were only, if I only had authority over this, then I could change everything, but I, I don't have any authority. What is the exact position that God's giving you? Will you invite him to speak into that position today. Maybe you are retired and it's time to invest in your grandchildren. Maybe you are a young mom who is overwhelmed at being home with small kids. Maybe God's calling you to invest in each of their little lives and not worry about all the other stuff the world wants you to do. I don't know what your position is, but what I do know is that we serve a God who is more powerful and loves to meet us and use us in the exact position that we're in. So here we see Paul, Paul the prisoner, getting up, encouraging a group of men who are probably in one of the scariest uh, ship stories of their lives. They're about to get shipwrecked. In, in, back in the day when um, guards were over prisoners, if a prisoner escaped, the guard would be punished. The guard would be executed because it was their responsibility to keep the prisoners in. So you can imagine these guards on the boat too thinking, if we lose all these passengers, th it's up to us. We're going to get penalized for this. And so Paul speaks hope. He speaks encouragement. He fulfills the purpose God has for him. And I wonder today, what is a purpose that God has for you in this season? And how can you use your position, no matter how glorified or how lowly it feels, how can you allow God to use your exact position for his glory? That's what we see Paul do in this text. And what happens is the crew becomes shipwrecks. Paul 
goes back to the word of God and says, remember God said none of you will be, will be lost. They all make it to shore and they arrive on Malta. And so we want to see the prisoner Paul. I want to see two things of how he uses his position in this. Uh, starting in ch- chapter 28, verse 1, it said, once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and p- cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. So here we see Paul. Paul, who just survived a shipwreck, is serving the community. He's one of the ones gathering wood. No position uh, kept Paul from doing what the purpose God had for him. He was there to serve. And so Paul's gathering firewood. He puts it in, and a snake, a poisonous snake, comes and latches onto his hands. And the people assume that this is the God's way of punishing him. And what does Paul do? He simply shakes it off and carries on. Paul uses the position that he's in, the circumstances that come into his life to give glory to God. And this is what I want to encourage you in today is that God uses everything for your good. I imagine Paul didn't want to get bitten by a venomous snake and Paul could have reacted strongly, but instead he knew that God had him and that God was going to fulfill his purpose in him. And so he focused on the mission, shook it off and trusted that God would take care of the rest. Is there anything in your life today that you need to shake off? Maybe a word someone's spoken over you, maybe a mistake you made in the past, uh, maybe a tax of somebody attacking your character, your reputation. Is there something that, that wants to destroy you, that the enemy means for evil and the Lord wants to use for good, wants you to shake off and, and remind you, you're okay, I got you. That's the God that we serve. We can trust a God who is bigger than our position and that uses us for his purposes. And then we see last, I don't need to read it all, but you, you've read the, I hope you've read this in your weekly reading. Uh, but Paul, Paul goes in uh, to the place he's staying and he heals the man uh, that's the head of the household. And because of that word spreads and Paul heals many. Paul, in his position as prisoner, does not forget the power of, of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the purposes God has for Paul. And he's used, he lets the Holy Spirit come, he ministers to people, he heals and makes the name of Jesus known. What is your position and what is your purpose? Will you invite God to do something bigger than you can ask, hope, or imagine? And now the last little section, we're headed into Rome. Um, And so we're gonna jump down to uh, chapter 28, verse 15. So they're headed into Rome. And this is where we pick up verse 15. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming and they traveled as far as the forum of APS and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a, with a soldier to guard him. Uh, so pause on this. So back in the day when they did house arrest, they would have soldiers stationed at six hour intervals around the clock. So when the, Paul is in his own house, but he is chained to a different soldier Every day, all day, six hours a day, four different guards a day, Paul is always bound and limited by somebody. So he gets there, he's on house arrest, he's bound to a soldier. Then on verse 17, it says, three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, my brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the custom of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of the crime deserving of death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I've asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of our people who have come from here have reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against the sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in an even larger number to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. So the last point I want to make today is that Paul didn't let his limitations restrict his love. Paul did not allow his limitations to restrict his love. You see, Paul was limited. 
Paul was chained to a soldier. He could not leave his house. But Paul allowed a love to be the guide of how he ministered. So the first thing he does is he thanks God for the people that came out. And then he goes to his home where he's prison bound. And he invites everyone to come to him. And the first thing he does is he apologizes. He says, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cause you any harm. Really my heart, my heart is that you would know Jesus. My heart is that we would not stand condemned because of the faith that we have. Remember, Paul loves the Israelites. Paul loves his people and he it grieves him that they don't know Jesus. And so Paul, even though he's stuck in one place, a man who's wandered thousands of miles preaching the good news, now he's bound and stuck and guarded. Paul doesn't use that as an excuse to stop loving other people. I wonder sometimes when you and I are limited in whatever capacity, if we're limited in time, if we're limited in money, if we're limited in emotional capacity and mental strength and physical ability, how often we let our limits uh, be an excuse for why we don't love people. Well, God, I can't help that person. I don't have enough money. God, I would love to sit and talk to them and hear about their heart, but I don't barely have time to take care of my kids. You and I can use sometimes our, our limitations as excuses, but here, This is where the power of the gospel does its best work, is that when through our limits, when through our weaknesses, the power of God is made known. In this position of lowliness and house arrest, Paul welcomes all people to come to them and he loves them. He tells them about the truth. He invites them in. He shares everything he has with them. And I wonder what what is blocking you in this season from loving others? Because the whole story of the Bible, the whole story of Jesus Christ, the entire book about Acts is really about love. It's about the love of God coming through you and I to a people who are lost and far away. And so Paul, Paul doesn't see this time as a break. Paul's been shipwrecked three times. He's been beaten. He's been imprisoned. Paul's had a journey. It would have been really easy. And I think I would have been really tempted if I were Paul to be like, you know what? This has been quite a journey. I'm going to take these two years to kind of recover, to recuperate, to spend this time in prayer and reflection. But no, instead, Paul says, bring everybody in. I want to tell them about Jesus. I want to tell them who my God is. Paul also used this time wisely. He wrote four books of the New Testament. Paul Paul was not slacking when he did this. Um, I have somewhere in my notes. I don't want to say I'm wrong. He wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. So Paul uses this time for the love of Jesus Christ, the God that Paul has encountered, that he's weathered the storm with. Paul trusts that God's love in him is enough to pour out unto others. And so he writes letters that have gone to the entire ends of the earth. The book of Ephesians is one of my favorite books. Paul writes these letters and the love of God continues to flow through him. How does God want his love to flow through you? Sometimes it's our greatest weaknesses that allow the power of God to be on display. So if you feel limited, if you are uh, confined in this season, I want to encourage you that there is a way that God still wants to move his love, the love of Jesus Christ, through you to people around you. The last verse of this text, it says, this is how the whole book of Acts ends. It says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Paul loved until the very end. Where is God inviting you to love today, this week, this year? Our mission as Christians is to love the Lord our God and to love those around us. And Paul does this till the very end. It reminds me of the passage in John 13, 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus, Jesus' final act of love was dying on the cross for us. And here we see the book of Acts close with Paul in chains for the gospel, proclaiming the love of Christ to all who will come to him. Have you allowed the love of Christ to filter into all parts of your life so that you can be a vessel that passes it on. We can tend to get caught up in all the things, the shoulds, the coulds, the woulds, 
all there's a list of things that all of us want to accomplish, but the main focus of following Jesus is to love him well by loving others. What I believe God is inviting us into is to trust him that his love is enough. That because Jesus loves us, our weaknesses, our vulnerabilities, our shame, our past, our history, uh, our insecurities, all those things, God can use them because his love is bigger than all of them. And we see this so clearly in Paul, that Paul trusts that the love of God is enough to carry him forward in his mission. And so this is how the book of Acts ends. Uh, You might be thinking, wait, what's the rest of the story? What happened? Well, I believe that Luke wrote the book of Acts with this specific ending uh, to remind us that the story of Acts, the story of the apostles, the story of those who follow Jesus isn't over. The end of the story isn't here yet. You and I are part of the story. God is still living and breathing and moving through the Holy Spirit in our lives. The book of Acts is a story that continues on and you and I are part of the story. So my question to you today, before we leave, my question is, are you willing to be part of the story? Do you trust that God still has plans to use you the same way that he used Paul, that God's work in you and for you, it isn't done. No matter how old you are, no matter how long or how short you've been in the faith, God has a plan for you and you're part of the story. We saw in the story today that Paul didn't let his circumstances determine his confidence and Paul didn't let his position change his purpose. And Paul didn't let these limitations restrict his love. And so my question for you as we close at the end of Acts, the story of the good news going out is where is the Lord inviting you to trust him to be part of his story? God knows the plans he has for you, plans to see you through the storm, plans to use you to love the people around you. Where is he inviting you today to step into that trust? Um, I used to be a swimming instructor for many years. I worked high school, college. I taught swimming lessons uh, to little kids. And one of the things I remember most vividly about teaching swimming lessons to kids is that in every class, there was always one or two students who were so, so afraid to let go of the edge of the wall. And so every, every year, every class, there would come a point where they had to do a swim test, where they had to jump off the wall and paddle three strokes to me. And every year, there was always a child who was afraid to do it. And I remember the feeling every time as is just thinking, oh, if I could only explain to them what I know, that I am so close that there is no way they could fall. And there is no way I would ever let them fall. But their little minds, they didn't know that because the distance they had to go seemed way too big for them. But I knew my own swimming ability and I knew how long my arms were and I knew that they were safe. And whenever I taught swimming lessons, I would be reminded of how that looks for my own relationship with God. So often he will invite us into something that seems too big or too scary or too painful. And I think of that feeling I felt of just knowing and just wanting to convince him like, trust me, you're going to be okay. Trust me, this is how you learn to swim. I believe God's saying that to you and I today. And I don't know specifically in your life what he's asking you to trust him in. But what I do know is that we serve a God who is safe and who is good and who is for us and who will never leave us or forsake us. And so will you get off the wall today? Will you dare to swim? Will you dare to believe in a God who is bigger than our problems, our circumstances, and our insecurities? Will you trust God with your very one precious life? Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you that you are a God worthy to be trusted, Lord. There is no one else or nothing else on this earth Uh, that delivers the confidence and the assurance and the refuge and the rock that you are, Father. That's by your definition who you are. And so, Lord, today, would you show each of us what it means to trust you, God? Would you reveal where we are in the storm, Lord, and what you're asking of us on the other side? Would you show us who you want us to love, Lord? And would you show us how our own position can be one that you use for your purposes, Father? 
We invite you into our lives today and we thank you for the book of Acts. And out of it, God, we desire to be people who trust and follow you. May it be so. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, it has been such a blessing to journey with you. I'm so thankful for your participation, for leaning into your groups, for doing the work each week. Um, I'm excited to kick off with you again next fall. We will be back. And in the meantime, we have reading Summer in the Psalms to read with, but prayers for you. Uh, Just blessings that the Father would meet you wherever you are in this season, and he would continue to minister to you in his word every single day that the Holy Spirit would be in you and that the gospel would go forth. Blessings on you. 